Back to my garden, episode 27. Welcome to Back to My Garden. Discover your passion for gardening. Here is Dave Ledoux. This episode of Back to My Garden is sponsored by Coffee Royalty. Can you really lose 5, 10, even 20 pounds or more just by switching your coffee or tea? Find out how to drink it for free at www.backtomygarden.com front slash coffee. Do you love homegrown tomatoes? Free Report reveals the five dirt cheap tools I use to grow 22 types of heirloom tomatoes, including my secret soil booster. Download your copy for free today at backtomygarden.com front slash free report. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world when you listen to this. I'm Dave Ledoux, and welcome to another edition of Back to My Garden. Today, we're going out to the East Coast to Connecticut. I want to welcome to the show, Jen McGinnis. Jen, welcome to Back to My Garden. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. Now comes the big intro. Hang on, here we go. She's an avid gardener and a blogger, a freelance photographer. She's queen of zone 6B and a talented pastry chef. And let me tell you, Jen, the most impressive thing about your blog is your gorgeous plant photography. I want to talk a lot about your photography hobby slash uh, art. But first, I want to get to know you. And I'm sure all the listeners want to get to know you. Uh, Jen, take a minute or two and just tell us a little bit about your background and how you first got into gardening. Sure. Uh, well, I grew up with gardening. It was always in my family. Um I used to live in Queens, and we had a little plot of land um, and my family. It was just me and my two parents. And across the bridge, we would uh, go across the Metro North Railroad tracks to Austin Street, which is where my grandfather lived. And he had a very small plot of land, but the things that he grew on there were amazing. And he had pear trees, he had tomatoes, he had flowers, he had grapes when he used to make wine, he uh, had raspberry bushes. It was just endless and everything grew for him. He had the ultimate green thumb. So he was just pretty much my inspiration growing up, and gardening became second nature because I just spent so much time with him. Fantastic. He's like a, a Gandalf for a Yoda archetype, the, uh, the old-timer, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty common, huh? <laughs> well, you know, you're in my camp. You came as a child into gardening. Yeah, and, and then yeah. there's this whole camp that maybe they grew up in a city or an apartment. Um, they never saw anything alive until they were in their 20s. That's true. I was on, on the lucky side in that I actually had access to a yard in Queens because a lot of things were just, you know, paved over in cement and pavement. So, so do you consider yourself a city girl? Um, I would say I used to be a city girl, and I've pretty much embraced the whole small town life. Not that we're extremely rural, but we have a nice little comfortable in between here in Portland. Wonderful. Now, for those of you driving in your car, keep both hands on the wheel. I'll put links to Jen, her blog on social media on the show notes. But if you've got a free hand, head over and follow Jen on Twitter at Jen M, as in McGinnis, Gardens, Jen M Gardens. And make sure you uh, bookmark and share Jen's blog. Now it's frazini.blogspot.com. That's F R A U Z I N N I E.blogspot.com. Before we dig deep into the gardening stuff, talk to me about your photography. Did you go to school for it? How did you develop it as a, as a hobby? You have exceptional talent. Oh, thank you very much. I, uh, I grew up always wanting to pictures. I had like those disposable cameras and when I was in high school I had access to a photo lab and I had access to my first um, Canon Rebel camera. I was able, it was the film version and I was able to borrow it through my high school's program and I really learned a lot through that class. And then when I went to college I majored in journalism and I did a minor in, almost a minor in photography. I was one class shy of it. But uh, I did all the studio photography, and it was so much fun being in the dark room. And, you know, you would pretty much go in there with a the blank piece of paper and turn on the enlarger and hope for the best, and hope that your film didn't get ruined when you were processing it. And uh, 
I think it was between that and then working later on in the newspaper business that I was forced to do my own photography and provide my own um, visuals for my stories and for the content of the Sunday paper that I really was able to get better at what I was doing with the photography. Wow. So you have a foot in old world media plus the new media. Yeah, yeah. I I do kind of miss the, the print, but I love the instantaneous gratification you get from the digital. And the digital cameras have come so far these days that it's really hard to say, well, film was better. It It is better, and it's in respect to its uh, nostalgia, but today's digital cameras just blow me away. Without getting super technical, uh, what kind of hardware are you using to take the f- photos on your blog? Oh, sure. Um, I usually use my EOS 5D. It's a Canon. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up with Canon, so I stayed loyal to them, but I have friends who use Nikons, and they swear by them. Um Right now, um, I primarily use a 70 to 200 millimeter lens to take uh, fast photos or like for sports photography or um, if I'm trying to get the hummingbirds in the yard because that way I don't have to get too close to them. But all the nice close-ups are usually shot with my macro lens. Do you think for a beginner that's a good choice? Um, I would say the Rebel cameras are still really good for beginners um, and the kit lens that they come with are really good too. I actually went from the Canon Rebel to the, I think it was the 50D. Um, I could double check that. But I think it was the Canon Rebel to the 50D, and then we just recently upgraded to the EOS 5D, and that's been remarkable in capturing the color. It's like everything is so much brighter and more vivid. I understand now, because when you look at your blog, I saw it on the iPad, so it kind of stretched stuff out, and, and you can scroll quick, and wow. Because... Why do you grow flowers? I mean, they're beautiful until they get smell on the iPad. <laughs> all you have is appearance. And yeah, congratulations. I mean, your, look, your sight is visually stunning. Oh, thank you. Uh, how did, I, uh, the, how did the name them. come about, by the way? Um, I was trying to think of something kitschy when I was starting my garden blog a while back. Um, I think I started it back in '09. And Oh, no, actually 2011. I moved out here in 2009. And uh, for some reason, I remembered that uh, title in German um, to be like a courtesy title would be Frau, to refer to a married woman. And I really love zinnias, so I just thought it would be a cute play on words to do Frau Zinni. But it actually confuses a lot of people because <laughs> they're not familiar with, uh, with the German title. Yeah, it's art. You could, you can, you do whatever you want in the art world. That's true. <laughs> I want to take you back, Jen, because there's always a gap when people garden as a child and then garden as an adult. Do you remember what the first thing you decided to grow was as an adult? And can you describe? Was there fear or trepidation or hesitation, or did you just jump in? I would say it would be geraniums. Um, because I was living on my own for the first time in my apartment in Connecticut, and I had all this light coming from uh, from a west-facing window. And geraniums, I remembered that my grandfather was able to overwinter them um, pretty easily. So I figured if he could overwinter them, then maybe they would be forgiving in the apartment. And they just loved it. They loved the sun. They loved. We had these big um, school windows because there was a converted school building that the apartment building was. So they were literally like six feet tall. And as I lived there for um, about two or three years, the geraniums just kept growing and growing and getting taller and taller. And it broke my heart when I had to cut them back when we moved, but they were just so, like, leggy and big we couldn't even get them in the car. (laughs) But I still have one of them. Nice. And you go from geraniums in your apartment. You, You went from geraniums in your apartment to your garden today, uh, I want to talk to you about that transition because some people garden just so they can have fresh vegetables and some for the beautiful flowers and some for the healthy herbs. And then for other gardeners, it's almost like physical or emotional recharging or therapeutic. What does gardening mean to you today? What do you get from it, Jen? Um, I think it's my ability to have me time and uh, it's also like living art. 
because you're able to create these landscapes that, you know, if this color doesn't go well with this one, you could just dig it up and move it around and make it look as nice as you want. Um, so it's kind of like my artistic outlet. Beautiful. Is there any correlation between your art and gardening and being a pastry chef? Um, I guess maybe the, the ability to work with your hands. I really like the hands-on um, aspect to both of those jobs. And it's really nice to be able to take things from the garden and create them into something delicious that people can eat. Like we, um, I, I grow a kefir pear tree. I have two of them now up front because I thought that was uh, the variety my grandfather grew just because they look similar. And then I learned later on after they produced that it wasn't a kefir pear tree. It was actually a Bartlett pear tree. And the difference is the Bartlett's are, um, you know, very nice to eat right off the tree. Um, the kefirs are made for baking. So it's kind of ironic that I inadvertently bought a tree that's only good for baking. <laughs> so um, it, really translates well to uh, scones and uh, clafoutis. I think I said that right. I'm not even sure. <laughs> but you can make tarts out of it. and um, So you could do that. And then, you know, there's always, like, the blueberry pound cakes you can make from the blueberries in the yard and just, you know, fresh fruit by itself with a little bit of clotted cream. It's fantastic. Wow, very cool. My sister-in-law has a catering company, and she focuses on uh, cakes and cupcakes. Oh, nice. And she says there's trends and, and like something's hot and then it's not. And right now it's uh, red velvet. Yep, that is very popular. She says if she has to make another red velvet cake, she'll scream. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe it was the Food Network that got everyone turned on to that one. But it literally was one day no one was asking for it. And then the next, everybody wanted it. And they've been pretty popular, I would say, for in our region, probably for two or three years now. Gardening is like that, too. There's things in vogue and then things fall out of favor. Where you are in Connecticut, uh, what are people talking about in their gardens? What What's the buzz? I would say right now the biggest push is to plant native um, plants that would help the butterflies and the beneficial insects. It seems like everyone's very uh, tuned into the chemicals that they've been putting on the plants at certain nurseries mm -hmm. and the nurseries that are organic are really clamoring and trying to get everyone's attention to like listen you know you may think that this plant over here is good but you might be poisoning the insects you've been trying to bring to your yard and here we are selling you plants that are organic and are safe and uh, there's also been a very big push towards milkweed i've noticed that a lot of people are just letting it grow wherever on their property. A lot of the open spaces, they're letting it grow. They're not mowing it down. And that's kind of nice that everyone's taking a responsibility to make sure that this plant that is the life source for monarch butterflies is actually being grown and not cut down this year. Brilliant. I have to admit, I'm in that camp. We're putting in a two-by-two two raised bed in the fall just for milkweed. Oh, that's great. Yeah. My, my wife says, we're doing a pollinator bed. I said, all right, what is that? You know, <laughs> and, yeah, it's, uh, it has to happen or we're going to be in deep trouble. Yeah, that's for sure. And it's good that it's becoming mainstream, that everyone is paying attention to it now. Good. Yeah, we're raising the consciousness through the conversation. Um, you're busy. You have lots of projects on the go. Talk to me about your garden this year. What are you growing that you're particularly proud of? And are you growing anything that's frustrating you? Um, I would say for the frustrating, right off the top of my head, is the black walnut trees that are on our border. Um, when I moved in, I wasn't really aware of what black walnut trees were. The previous owner said that if we ever had to cut them down, they'd make excellent um, wood for sale because the black walnut grows so straight. But I love trees, so, you know, the thought of cutting down a tree just for, for profit really didn't appeal to me. So I was fine with letting them stay and be there. And then I noticed that as I would plant things near them, they wouldn't grow so well. I started losing uh, hydrangeas, or the lilacs started to look stunted, and uh, I lost uh, flower and quince, which are so beautiful and would have looked perfect in the backyard, but everything just kept failing and then other things would be fine like hostas would be fine 
uh, daffodils would flourish. Um, so would the daylilies. And I just couldn't really wrap my brain around it. And then I started asking questions like, you know, this is what I have in the yard. I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. I, you know, I'm not overwatering. I'm not, maybe it's the soil. And then it finally clicked in my head that it's the black walnut. And what that does, it's a tree that uh, emits this basic poison into the ground. It's a, it's called jubilone. Um, I may not be saying that correctly, but what it does, it cancels out any other plant nearby. So that way there's no competition for it. So there's some plants that are very susceptible to that black walnut tree. And the ones that were failing in my yard, such as the hydrangeas, the lilacs, the peonies, they were all on the list of things you're not supposed to grow within like 100 feet of a black walnut tree. So at first it was very frustrating and, you know, I'm losing these plants that I paid money for. And then I realized, well, I don't want to lose them. I don't want them to die. So I started digging them up and moving them to the front yard where it was further away from the tree. And so far, some of them that seemed a little bit stunted are starting to come back. Uh, it depends on, like, how soon I got them out of the yard. But now I'm being more conscious about what I put in the backyard. And, you know, when I'm at the nursery and I get tempted by this beautiful flower and I think, oh, this is going to be great, i got to fit it in somewhere, I get out my phone and I start checking the list of what black walnut trees are um, friendly with. And if it's not on the list, I don't even think about putting it back there anymore. Wow. Great detective work. Congratulations. Thanks. It was pretty frustrating. But now that I... Now that I'm clued into it, it, it definitely makes a difference. It's amazing. Well, I guess it's a very powerful tree. Yeah, and Good these and ones bad. are very old. They're very tall. So I would say they're probably at least 40, minimum 40 years old. So they, they probably have some pretty deep roots. <laughs> wow. Okay, so it, you're reacting to reality. I mean, it's either fight the losing fight or move stuff. Yeah, and I mean, I... I don't have the money to chop down a perfectly healthy tree, so I figured, you know, it does shade the house in the summertime when it gets hot. And uh, you can eat the black walnuts. Some people are really into that, but I I don't because it's so hard to actually harvest it from the husk. Mm -hmm. But, like, last summer was a really good year for black walnut trees, but it also became dangerous to walk around in the backyard because either the squirrels would, you know, wiggle the branches and they'd just come down it would be like heavy artillery and you hear them hitting off the garage roof or the shed roof and you just kind of duck and cover you know <laughs> and you try not to roll your ankles as you're walking across the lawn because they were everywhere Wow! so i guess if anybody wants black walnuts i'm the place to be <laughs> where my heart had in the backyard that's incredible Pretty much. Wow. yeah and so in terms of what are you growing this year that you're particularly proud of, do you have any victories? Um, I would say the daylilies are phenomenal this year, and I didn't realize how much I really liked daylilies until they all started flowering this year, and I go, oh, I didn't realize I had a red one or an orange one or a yellow one. So that's pretty nice. They're all doing really well, and uh, the garlic is always a bonus. Um, it's one of those vegetables that... You can kind of ignore it, kind of does its own thing, and then it tastes much better. Uh, Every every vegetable you grow at home always tastes better than what you buy in the store. But it's it's so easy, and I'm pretty happy with that this year. Are you one of those ladies that love to share plants? I do, yeah. And I live right next door to a a woman who also likes to share plants, so it's pretty nice. Yep, I'm... I always look at you, you, the ladies that share the flowers like um, happy, healthy drug dealers. The first <laughs> one's free, and then you get more people involved. And it is the most social community I've ever seen, isn't it? Gardeners are just friendly people. Yeah, everyone's more than willing to to talk to you. And you know, I've gone to a lot of events where I don't know anyone, and and usually I can rely on at least one person coming over and being like, well, what, what are you interested in? And what are you, why are you here? And there's always some common bound, which really helps. You're in Connecticut. What kind of a season for weather are you having? Because the drought is so paralyzing in a big part of the U.S. Yeah, we're pretty dry this year. I would say we're not as bad as other parts of the country, but we have been really reliant on the rain barrels to water the yard um i've broken down and watered the yard with our hose a couple times i try not to just because the cost of water in our area is really high 
Um, so we've been trying to be good about planting the plants that need most water closer to the house and the ones that are a little bit more drought, to- drought, drought tolerant out closer to the road. Nice. Nice. Yeah, we have some friends that grow bearded irises, and uh, they almost look like a, I don't know, when you were a kid, do you know what a float is? Like when you have uh, vanilla ice cream and root beer or Coca-Cola? Yeah, yeah. The bearded iris is that color, like a root beer float color, kind oh, of color. Oh, that sounds beautiful. Yeah. And uh, where I live, you know, the farmers 100 years ago or 80 years ago just stuck the uh, lilies by the mailbox on the side of the gravel road, which are now paved. But you'll see lilies in the weirdest places in the countryside where I live. They're almost naturalized. That sounds beautiful. So you're just driving around and you just see all these beautiful flowers? Yeah, and you go, what the heck is that doing there? Like, And then, you know, there's 40 or 50 of the. As wow, they grow. that must be so nice. <laughs> yep. and I'm kind of uh, the same zone as Cleveland, Ohio for weather. Oh, okay. I think I'm one ahead of you. Like a little chillier, a little cooler, but probably what you grow, I can grow. That sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny how, like, you're in a different spot in the U.S., but it kind of all has a similar pattern. Well, people think Canada, you guys are growing igloos and snowmobiles and and whale blubber, but (laughs) it it dips down, and I'm on the, you know, I'm only an hour and a half from Detroit. Okay. But we get all four seasons just like you. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, I was up in Montreal a couple years ago, and I went to their botanical gardens, and I was actually really surprised, now that you say that, of what they were growing, because I did think, like, oh, it must be cold here all the time. (laughs) It's cold in Montreal, though. That's a great town, though. A lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, it was. And uh, did you feel like you were kind of in a little bit of a different country? I did. Um, It probably didn't help that I didn't, I don't know any French. So even though people do speak English, the first, um, it seemed like the first inclination was to speak French. So I felt a little bit like an outsider and I got a little bit lost on the highways with our rented car. But after I got through that, (laughs) I know the (laughs) signs. I made it to the garden. (laughs) They spell West and East different, don't they? Yeah, you know, I can't really remember, but I just, I just remember everything being Rue Day and then some name. And I was just thinking, oh my God, they all look the same to me. <laughs> yeah. Quebec is a fun place. That's good. Let's take a minute to thank our sponsors, and then we'll come back and play five quick questions. What's the hottest trend in gardening? I think the hottest trend is aquaponics. Can you really grow a massive garden powered by fish? Find out more and discover the secrets to building fish-powered gardens at www.backtomygarden.com front slash fish. Attention gardeners, do you love perennial flowers? Get a free online catalog and 10% off your first order of bulbs at Bloom and Bulbs. I set up a link just for podcast listeners. Go to www.backtomygarden.com front slash bulb for your special bonus. Um, you know, Jen, our time is rapidly escaping us, and it's now time in the show when we get to play my favorite game called Five Quick Questions. Sure. This is where you get to share your wisdom and experience with rookie gardeners. Are you ready to play? Sure. Sounds well, good to me. Question number one. In your opinion, what do you think stops most people from trying to grow their first garden? I would say lack of free time. Because everyone seems to be so hectic and trying to pack everything into their days that they might almost feel a little bit guilty to take that me time and go outside and be with nature. Nice. Good. Question two. You've learned gardening the hard way and hands-on and from books and the internet and plus old-timey gardeners. What's the single best piece of gardening advice that you've ever received? I would say always get a soil test. And I was pretty resistant to that in the beginning because I thought, well, you know, I can just put something in the ground and it'll grow. But when things were being, um, like if you get the yellow leaves or things aren't growing as well as they should be, it was always, it always came down to the soil. So now I have been trying to test different parts in my yard to see what the soil looks like and see how much I can compost, et cetera, that I can add to it to make it better so the plants do better. 
You're giving me the freak out here. Um, <laughs> we literally did the chemistry lab test this morning. You know, when you put scoops in and pour the powder and it turns colors? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> one of our raised beds had a pH of 8 and a nitrogen of 0. Oh, wow. Well, no wonder nothing would grow in it. <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> yeah, everything was so angry, and I'm going, why are you so angry, tomato? Well, there's no nitrogen. <laughs> oh, wow. Very good. Um, hey, what do you guys struggle with in terms of the soil there? We're really acidic. Like, mm. I have one part of the air, of the yard that the rhododendrons would form buds, and they weren't uh, blooming. So I asked for help, and I was told to get a soil test, and I said, oh, of course, I forgot that part. And uh, it turns out the soil in that area is 4.6 um, on the pH scale. So it's just so acidic that the plants are having a hard time even pulling up the nutrients. So yeah. I have to work on getting it higher. I love the science part of gardening. Everything is measurable and quantifiable. It's great. Yeah, and that ties into the pastry chef, too. You know, you got to make sure everything is exact or you won't get the, the dessert as you should, you know? <laughs> Except everyone has a great aunt who doesn't own a spoon and everything's a handful or a dash or a dab. Oh, yeah. That's more common, I think, with the culinary, with the with the uh, pastry side. You have to be a little bit more exact or you might have the baking soda explode your cake or something. <laughs> yeah, very good. Good advice. Uh, question three. Uh, other than your own wonderful blog and my wonderful blog, what are two fantastic websites that you would recommend to a new gardener? Um, I would say definitely awaytogarden.com. That's run by Margaret Roach. She's kind of like my person I go to to see what she's doing, and I admire her greatly. I remember reading her book when I was a teenager, and I actually met her in person, and she's such a lovely person, and she's everything I was hoping she would be. And she's she's up in, um, like, not totally upstate New York, but mid-state New York, and um, she does great organic gardening. And I would say the other one would probably be organicgardening.com, which is uh, the magazine site, just because they seem to be pretty active and keeping it updated, and they have a lot of topics that are relevant. So there's always something interesting over there. Beautiful. Awaytogarden.com and organicgardening.com. If you're jogging, listening to your iPad or your iPhone, I'll put this in the show notes. Don't have to stop and take notes. Jen, I love to read. What is a gardening book that you suggest that I have to read this year? I would actually say uh, my choice is a little old school. <laughs> I still use Crockett's Victory Garden as a manual. I don't do, um, you know, I don't apply the pesticides as he kind of recommended back in the 70s, but the basics to gardening are there. And I still find that I go back to pull out his book when I'm starting seeds in January, February to double check, like, is this the right time to do pansies or wax begonias? So it's not just about the vegetables in that book. It's also it touches on the flowers, too, which is really nice. Fantastic. Uh, on a tangent here, here's that rabbit trail I mentioned. When you're getting it ready in January, February, do you do window sills or do you have a grow light set up? I actually have a three-tier grow light that my husband has graciously allowed me to have in the kitchen because we live in a small ranch. And uh, we don't have a dining room. So there's the kitchen, the kitchen table, and the grill lights. So for about three or four months of the year, the lights go on at 5.30 in the morning, and he jokes that he doesn't have to even turn them on to get ready for work because the plants are growing. <laughs> for all the married fellas out there, let's take our hats off to Mr. McGinnis. Happy wife, happy life. Very strategic. <laughs> Number five. This is a fun one. Jen. In your opinion, what's one thing every beginner gardener should try to grow next year? I would say bring it back to the garlic because, uh, as I was saying earlier, it's really easy to grow. It tastes great, um, and it's pretty pest resistant. Like it, you know, you don't have Japanese beetles wanting to get all over it. Uh, it keeps away aphids. It's a great companion plant for a lot of other plants, such as roses, uh, tomatoes, cucumbers. The only thing you really can't plant near it is strawberries or peas or beans. Um, but everything else is pretty happy with it, and you can ignore it. And, you know, it's it's just one of those 
I need something good to make me feel good, and this is the plant that'll do it. <laughs> I love it. Um, does your garlic play nice with your black walnut, or they don't get along? Um, you know, I haven't tested it back there. I don't think it's on the list, but I haven't really been willing to try the crop back there yet, just in case it does fail. I think it's safe because I have done onions back there, but I'm kind of protective of the garlic. So, <laughs> I love the garlic idea because when I go to the grocery store, most of the garlic that we get over here comes from China. That's a long trip. Yeah, that is. And I think they spray them with something so they won't sprout either. Yeah. I mean, if you're traveling two months by boat, um, yeah, I mean... They don't grow things the way we grow things over here, do they? That's true, yeah. And the best thing about the garlic is that, you know, you harvest it around this time now, and then you let it dry for a couple of weeks, and then it, it'll last you probably till February, March. Amazing. Well, folks, uh, we're coming to the end of another great podcast. I want to make sure you follow Jen on Twitter. It's at Jen M. Gardens. Share her stuff. Make sure you check out Frazini. It's F-R-A-U-Z-I-N-N-I-E dot blogspot dot com. Amazing photography. Um, Jen, you've been an incredible guest. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of your podcast. I want to give you the last word. Can you leave our listeners with either a pearl of wisdom or a note of encouragement on their gardening adventure? Um, I would say don't be... You know, uh, oh, what's the good word for this? Don't be intimidated by a big project. When I moved in, the whole front yard, the whole backyard was lawn, and I just slowly dug up little pieces of lawn, put in my flowers, and then I'd put in another bed. Soon that bed would connect to the other one. And now my husband jokes that he can't even mow the lawn anymore because it's just a series of paths. And as a result, we're trying to just mulch them all so that way there is no more lawn to mow. So no no project is ever undoable. You can definitely you can definitely do it. Fantastic. Jen, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you.